Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm glad that you could join me uh, this Wednesday for Bible study. Um, I kind of changed uh, the formatting of the video a little bit, so if I am blurry, um, I apologize, but it's not about the way I look. It's about what we're studying and we're studying the Word of God. So just forgive me if the video is a little bit off. That's just the way it is for this recording. Um, we continue uh, now in session four, um, His Ways Are Higher, study of Job. I've got my youthberry coffee, I mean youthberry tea from Tivana that's very good. Um, if you ever want to know about a tea, just ask me. I'll be able to tell you if it tastes good or not. This was from dinner. We had firehouse. Well, last week, um, we almost made it through the entire prologue. Uh, we worked our way last week through chapters 1 and 2, verse 10. That's how far we got. Well, today we finish up the prologue, 2, 11 through 13, and then we're going to work our way through chapter 3. I bet you thought we were going to go all 14 chapters, 1 through 14, and which I attempted to do, I tried to do, but um, it was just stressing me out, to be honest. So I am kind of cut it back. We're just going to look at one chapter tonight um, or today, whenever you're watching the video on Wednesday. Um, we're going to look at can get all the way through chapter 3. Uh, now, I am at home, so if you hear some noise in the background, uh, Logan's supposed to be coming home soon from work, and the other boy, Kyle's studying for an exam tomorrow, and Seth, I don't know where he is, and Mom, Kim, is in the back bedroom. <clears throat> so if you hear some noises, it's us. <laughs> um, well, let's pray together, and we will get into uh, the next part of our study. Father, we thank you for the privilege of coming around your word and studying it. I pray, Lord, you continue to open our hearts and minds to receive it, that you teach us about yourself, your character, who you are, how you deal with us, how we are in relation to you. Thank you for loving us, for caring for us so deeply that you provided your word alive, sharper than a two-edged sword, to teach, to illuminate, to, to mature us. Thank you, Father, for blessing us in this way. Now teach us tonight from Job 3. We love you. We praise you, exalt you. In Christ's name we pray together. Amen. Well, as we begin tonight, um, we're going to reflect for just a moment on Hebrew poetry. Um, Job opens, we've already talked about this, but I need to recap it just a little bit. Job opens with the prologue, and then it concludes with the epilogue. Between the prologue and the epilogue, we have what's known as Hebrew poetry, and it's in prose, uh, I'm sorry, the prologue and epilogue are in prose form. Now, prose form means that it is written in ordinary language. It's in the form of ordinary spoken or written language. Then when we get to chapter 3, chapter 3, through chapters 42, verse 6, the writer switches from prose to poetry. Uh, now, Hebrew poetry is not like our poetry. Um, there's no concern to the Hebrew poet for rhyme. Um, the he Hebrew poetry uh, relies heavily on parallelism. We've talked about this a little bit before. Parallelism is a structure of thought um, rather than meter or rhyme in which the writer balances a series of words or phrases and patterns of contrast or repetition. So we're going to see a lot of compare and contrast in chapter 3, beginning in chapter 3 specifically, and then it, we'll see it all throughout the rest of the book of Job. But we're going to see a great example right out of the gate in chapter 3 of this Hebrew poetry in parallelism. Now again, let me just back up and reiterate. I think I skipped it. Job opens up with the prologue, chapters 1 and 2, and then it ends with an epilogue, 40, chapter 42, verses 7 through 17. And then we have chapters 3 through 42, 6, prose. Um, I did it again. Poetry, Hebrew poetry. Um, 
Anyway, chapter th- chapter 2, beginning in verse 11, to finish up the prologue. Uh, we're going to in- be introduced to, to Job's three friends. So if you have your Bibles, 2, verse 11 through 13. When Job's three friends, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite, heard about all the troubles that had come upon him, they set out from their homes and met together by agreement to go and sympathize, nod, bemoan with him, and comfort, sigh, breathe strongly with him. Verse 12, when they saw him from a distance... They could hardly recognize him. They began to weep aloud, wailing, lamenting loudly. And they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads, which was their custom of grief. Verse 13, Then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights, also their custom expression of grief. No one said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. Now, Here's an important thing for us to understand about great suffering, about grief. Um, It deeply changes a person. Um, Great suffering, great grief manifests itself both chemically and physically in a person's body. It changes a person. It often changes a person into someone almost unrecognizable. This was a case of Job. His friends didn't recognize him. It's so important for us as ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you're a Christian, a disciple of Christ, you are a minister. So it's important for us as ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Why is it so important for us to know that about suffering? Because in a person's life, in those moments of great suffering, great grief, it's in those moments that we need to have available to them and we need to extend to them deep, deep wells of grace, mercy, and compassion. Paul, in Galatians 6, 2, the Holy Spirit through Paul exhorts us as Christians to bear one another's burdens. When we do, we will be fulfilling the law of Christ, love God, love people. Those who suffer great grief, great um, uh, emotional, physical pain, um, they may speak in a way, they may act in a way that is contrary to their usual selves. Don't let this take you by surprise. Don't allow a person's changed behavior or language cause you to accuse or jump to conclusions to the whys as Job's friends did. Now let's think about Job's friends for just a moment. Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, and then the fourth friend, chapters 32 through 37, Elihu, son of Barakel, the Buzite of the family of Ram. Why these four friends? Well, only God knows. Perhaps this thought has crossed your mind. Um, It did mine as I was studying. Why were Job's friends presented in the way, in the order that they were presented? Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, and then Elihu. Well, in the ancient Near East, Their custom was always to recognize first the oldest or the elder of a group, then move in successive order to the youngest. So as we think through their ancient Near East custom, Eliphaz would have been older, the oldest, then Bildad, then Zophar, and then lastly in chapters 32 and 37, Elihu. If you'll notice in chapter 32, Elihu said that he was the youngest in years. So Elihu said, tells us that he is the youngest. So it makes sense biblically and according to the the context, the immediate context, Eliphaz was the oldest and then Bildad, then Zophar, and then lastly, 
um, Elihu. That's very interesting. Um, I thought it was an interesting note to take um, because it sets our minds uh, to the immediate context, their customs. Now when we get to chapter 3, we just now, that was finished up the, the prologue. We're finished with chapters 1 and 2. Now we move into the poetic part of Job. Let's look at the first three verses, chapter 3. <clears throat> Job speaks. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. He said, May the day of my birth perish and the night that said a boy is conceived. Okay. Remember parallelism. We talked about it in the beginning of tonight, today together. Verse 3 sets us up for the first instance of parallelism. Look at verse 3 again with me. May the day of my birth perish and the night that said a boy is conceived. Well, the question, what are the two things in compare and contrast? Look at verse 3 again. What two things are being compared and contrasted. May the day of my birth perish and the night that said a boy is conceived. Well, the answer to what are the two things being compared and contrasted is day and night. The writer of Job now, through verse 3, sets us up for the parallelism. He's going to con compare and contrast day and night. Now, the writer continues, the poet continues. He begins to further explain bound in parallel compare and contrast on day and night. Verses 4 and 5, day. Verse 4, that day may it turn to darkness. See the play on words? May God ab above not care about it. May no light shine on it. May gloom and utter darkness claim it once more. May a cloud settle over it. May blackness overwhelm it. It being the day of Job's birth. Now the writer shifted the contrast to night. Verse 6. That night may thick darkness seize it, the day of my birth. May it not be included among the days of the year, nor be entered in any of the months. Verse 7. May that night be barren. So obviously... Job's actual birth was at night. He took his first breath at night. May no shout of joy be heard in it. May those who curse days curse that day. Those who are ready to rouse Leviathan, may its morning stars become dark. May it wait for daylight in vain and not see the rays of first dawn, for it did not shut its doors of the womb on me to hide my to hide trouble from my eyes. So the writer set us up in verse 3 for parallelism. Day and night. Verses 4 and 5, he spoke about the day. Verses 6 through 10, he spoke about that night. Job said, May the day be struck from the calendar, and may that night, he was born at night, be forgotten. So that was compare and contrast of day and night. Now, continuing in that mindset of parallelism, we continue there, but the subjects change. Remember, we're dealing with Hebrew poetry. That's why it's hard to grasp parts of Job because it's poetry. The compare and contrast subjects change, and verses 11 and 12 set it up. Now, these are a little bit harder to see. See if you can spot the compare and contrast. Verse 11. Why did I not perish at birth and die as I came from the womb? Verse 12. Why were there knees to receive me and breasts that I might be nursed? Well, what were the two things the poet was comparing and contrasting? Look at it again. Why did I not perish at birth and die as I came from the womb? Why were there knees to receive me and breasts that I might be nursed? 
Well, the two things that are being compared, the two things that are, that are contrasted in parallelism is death and life. Verse 11, death. Why did I not perish at birth and die as I came from the womb? Verse 12, life. Why were there needs to receive me? Life. And breasts that I might be nursed. Continued life. The writer continued with that parallelism. He continued his poem by now embellishing on these two new subjects. Death and life. Death. Verses 13 through 19. Look at it with me. For now I would be lying down in peace. I would be asleep and at rest. With kings and rulers of the earth who built for themselves places now lying in ruins. With princes who had gold, who have filled their houses with silver. Or why was I not hidden away in the ground like a stillborn child, like an infant who never saw the light of day? There the wicked cease from turmoil, and there the weary are at rest. Captives also enjoy their ease. They no longer hear the slave drivers shout. The small and the great are there, and the slaves are freed from their owners. Okay, now death contrasted compared with life, verses 20 through 23. Let's begin reading verse 20. Why is light given to those in misery and life to the bitter of soul, to those who long for death that does not come, who search for it, death, with more than a hidden treasure, who are filled with gladness and rejoice when they reach the grave? Why is life given to a man whose way is hidden, whom God has hedged in? Job, the writer of Job, Job's speech finished comparing death and life. I think that's very interesting to follow and trace parallelism. Well, lastly, We get a glimpse, a further glimpse, into Job's state of mind, his state of being. Verses 24 through 26. For sighing has become my daily food. My groans pour out like water. What I feared has come upon me. What I dreaded has happened to me. I have no peace. I have no quietness. I have no rest. Only turmoil. Look at verse 25. What did Job fear? What did he dread? We have to reach all the way back to chapters 1 and 2. What did Job fear? What did he dread? What has come upon him? Well, the things that have happened to him. All of his resources were taken away. All of his children were killed. His entire body was covered with putrid, scabbed over sores. All he can do is sit in ash, sigh, and groan. Ever since, Job says, ever since, he has had no peace, no quietness, no rest. Job's suffering was great, wasn't it? His grief was great. Have you ever felt like Job? Suffered, grieved deeply. Do you know of someone who you have seen suffer or grieve deeply? Changes a person, doesn't it? Well, I hope that you haven't suffered or grieved deeply. There are many out there who do. There are many out there in our everyday life who who are. We need to be very vigilant of that and pick up on that and, and notice that in a person's life. What a ministry opportunity. Our loved ones, our family members. 
You know, there's a lot of unanswered questions people have. Job is continually asking why. But one day, we're going to have all the answers. Right now, we're not going to. Why such suffering? Why such grief? Well, I'm going to look to you to answer that as we continue studying Job. Surely, Job's friends are going to be able to help him. Don't you think? <laughs> Surely, Job's friends have some wisdom, have some knowledge that's going to be able to help him. Surely, they will encourage Job. They will comfort Job. Surely, they will. Well, we're going to see next week if they do. And we're going to see next week as we get into Job's first friend's reply, um, Eliphaz. He is going to reply to Job's lament, and that's going to be in chapter 4. So tonight, that's all I wanted to do today, whenever you're watching the video. And again, I'm doing this late on a Tuesday night, and I am wiped out. So I may um, not be making sense. I hope not. If I am, call me out, ask me questions. I'll be glad to reiterate anything that I said, because everything that I said, I, I work off of notes, word for word. That's just the way I've done it. I will always do it. That's just me, my style. So if, if you're mixed up on something, just ask me and I'll try to straighten it out. But I do have homework for next week. Now, your only homework that should have been turned in today, Wednesday, or thought about was just to read chapters, um, I think, 2 through 14. It might have been 1 through 14. Of course, we're not going to cover it all. Um, but uh, next week, though, um, here's your homework. There are... Um, Four, let me get back, yep, four questions. So here's your homework. Reread chapters three through seven. And then answer the following questions. Number one, from chapter four, what two sources of wisdom was Eliphaz drawing from to advise Job? So that's your first question. Question number two, from chapters four and five, according to Eliphaz, what was the reason for Job's suffering? Please give the verse references. So question two, chapters four and five, according to Eliphaz, what was the reason for Job's suffering? And please give verse references. Okay, question three, <clears throat> chapter five, according to Eliphaz, what actions did Job need to take for his suffering to stop? Question four from chapter seven. Who was Job speaking to? Please provide your proof. Now listen. Please don't let these questions, any of the homework, keep you from participating. If you don't want to answer them, don't answer them. But I'd love for you to because it leads into our next section of study. And this is what we're doing. We're studying. I don't want to spoon feed you. You know, I don't want to be spoon fed. I want to learn on my own. So learn on your own and then we'll come together and I will present what some of the answers are. So let me go over the homework again. Reread chapters 3 through 7 and then answer the following questions. Number 1 from chapter 4. What two sources of wisdom was Eliphaz drawing from to advise Job? You'll find the answers in verses 8 through 21. Question 2. Chapters 4 and 5. According to Eliphaz, what was the reason for Job's suffering? And then please give the verse references. Question 3 from chapter 5. According to Eliphaz, what actions did Job need to take for his suffering to stop? And then question four from chapter seven, who was Job speaking to? And then please provide your proof. Very simple. Again, email them to me, markibc7 at al.com. 
text them to me, 985-634-1838, or hand them to me on Sunday. Either way, it'd be great. Well, I hope that you're enjoying it. I'm enjoying putting it together. I had planned on recording this earlier today, Tuesday, but uh, things uh, popped up, so I had to be out of the office for a while. Um, so I got behind of recording, so it's, it's really late. And again, if I've babbled or if I've missed something, if I've confused anybody, please ask me and let me clarify for you because I don't want you to be confused. I want you to be enjoying this as much as I am putting it together. Well, I love you all so much. And I'm glad that you've joined me today for Bible study. Let's pray together and we will wrap it up. All right, Father, we thank you again for the privilege of, of studying your word. Father, give us a hunger. Give us a deep hunger to know you more through the pages of your word. Teach us. Illuminate our hearts. Open our minds and, and hearts to receive your word. Lord, I know that there are many out there that are suffering, that are grieving deeply. Lord, I pray for them. I lift them to you. I pray that you just en encircle them in your arms and just bring them close and just pour out an extra grace, an extra mercy, an extra long suffering on them, Lord. They need you so desperately, Lord. Be very close to them. Let them sense very keenly your presence with them. Lord, we lift them to you. Lord, we thank you for those times that you heard us when we're suffering, when we've grieved. Lord, you've brought us through so much, and we're, we're thankful. We praise you. We bless you for bringing us through, knowing that when we face those times of suffering, those times of grief, you're right there, right there. Thank you for loving us that much. Lord, we love you. We praise you. Exalt you. Magnify your name. It's in Christ's name we pray together. Amen. Well, again, I love y'all. Y'all have a good rest of your uh, 